Well, DeepSeek strikes again. DeepSeek R10528 is here. I think at first everybody thought this was a minor update to the original DeepSeek R1 model, but it seems like it's nothing of the sort. DeepSeek R1 jumped from its older January 2025 model to today's model released May 28, 2025. The jump from the older model to the new model is pretty huge. It basically jumps to the front of the pack. On Live Code Bench, DeepSeek, this new version of it, is on par with O3 High. On the AI ME 2024 and 2025, it's slightly behind the O3, but ahead of Gemini 2.5 Pro. And on the other benchmarks that they've posted here, it's also near the top, beating out Gemini 2.5 Pro in a number of cases. This is kind of a big deal. We were all expecting R2, the next kind of a big model to drop. And I think most of us kind of suspected that the results would be something like this. It would jump to the front of the pack, maybe not to number one, but definitely somewhere in the very top, competing head to head with the best OpenAI, Gemini, and Anthropic models. We're also still waiting for the new version of Grok to come out, so we'll see where that falls. But the big point to understand here that this isn't R2. We still believe that R2 is coming. But if what we see with these benchmarks holds up in real life, that means that this open source model is now comparable to Gemini 2.5 Pro, and we might see something even bigger and open source dropping in the future. Now, the question is, how did they do this? So this is Sam, I'm going to say Page. I apologize if that's an incorrect pronunciation, but he runs EQ Bench. EQ Bench is an emotional intelligence benchmarks for LLMs, and he found something very interesting. So this is the first time that I'm aware of this project, so keep that in mind, but it sounds like he's got a slop profile for each model, so kind of like what kind of AI slop are these models putting out? And he uses bioinformatics tools to infer their lineage trees, which is, I got to give it to him, kind of brilliant. Again, I mean, first time I'm looking at this, so take this with a grain of salt. But I mean, if this works, then this is terrific. Because here's the slop profile for DeepSeek R1, this brand new model that got released yesterday. And as you can see here, it kind of analyzes the various outputs in creative writing to find the top creative words, top bigrams, top trigrams, etc. Basically, all these models, they kind of have their tendencies to use a certain expression, certain words, right? You've probably heard delve used a lot by the GPT models. You've heard, you know, tapestries. They love to say tapestries. So similar to how corporate executives love to use the word paradigm, you know, Chad GPT loves to use delve and the tapestries. And so here you can kind of see, so underlined, highlighted yellow there is DeepSeek R1, the original model. So as you can see here, it's kind of branching off of the O3. So it's similar to the GPTs, right? So OpenAI's models. Notice Quasar Alpha is on there. That's interesting because it sounds like tools like this could be used to predict who, you know, has the models that are, you know, codenamed something if they appear in LLM Arena and they're getting tested, but we don't know the actual name or who made them. This seems like a pretty easy way to try to figure out who's behind the model. But yeah, basically notice that the original DeepSeek is kind of in the cluster of OpenAI technology. What about the new just released DeepSeek R1 0528? It's over here kind of branching off of, you know, the Gemini technology, Google Gemma, Gemini 2.5 Flash. And it seems very, very similar to Gemini 2.5 Pro Experimental. I'll leave links to Sam's stuff here. So if everybody wants to check it out, it's on GitHub. He's got a website and uh, I gotta say this is pretty cool. It's some AI forensics stuff here. That's uh, a, a neat idea, I gotta say. But what's the point of all this? Well, as Sam says here, if you're wondering why the new DeepSeek R1 sounds a bit different, I think they probably switched from training on synthetic OpenAI to synthetic Gemini outputs. So there's this kind of open secret in the AI industry, and that is that all of these companies are sort of taking the outputs of others' existing models and using those outputs to train their models on that. And that's why sometimes you'll ask, for example, a non-OpenAI model, you know, what architecture it's running on. It'll say it's, oh, I'm on OpenAI's GPT architecture. Or perhaps they'll refuse to do something and it'll say, oh, this goes against OpenAI's policies. 
and nobody really talks about this, but it just sounds like a fairly common practice, right? They, they call it knowledge distillation, right? Distilling or training on the synthetic data from other models, etc. Now, if that's the case, this is kind of a big deal. As you know, both China and the US are racing to advance their AI efforts. This isn't just my opinion. Here's the US Department of Energy saying AI is the next Manhattan Project and the United States will win. So they're basically comparing the development of AI to the development of the nuclear bomb. And if you followed the meeting of the Saudi leaders, right? So Elon Musk, Sam Altman, Jensen Huang was there, many, many other people. They're looking to partner up with allies in the AI development space to get enough energy to power the training and running of these AI models. So this is a statement made by Balaji a few months ago, I believe. The idea is that we're going to expect to see a complete blitz of Chinese open source AI models from computer vision to robotics to image generation and deep seek large language models as well. Why would that be the case? Well, potentially their goal could be to take the profit out of AI software since they make money on AI enabled hardware. Right, so they can build the physical stuff better than we can here in the US. The US is really good at the software, has been leading in software, has been leading in AI. But the US tech companies, of course, need money, need funding, need resources to keep buying NVIDIA chips, etc., to continue growing and developing AI. Now, if some open source model, whether that's DeepSeek or somebody else, can basically, every time the US tech firms right get to the front of the line, create the best closed source models, if somebody can just, you know, retrain their model and get to the front of the pack, providing the open source AI for free or very, very cheaply and releasing the weight so that people can use it for their own specific use cases to, to fine tune it for their own applications, etc., that really takes the wind out of the sails of a lot of these companies. They, it takes away the funding, their ability to make money. And so if the open source models just heap pace with the best of the best models, with the best closed source models, that basically, you know, erases any profit margins for these big companies. They can't charge three times the price for the same performance. And the cost difference could be a lot more than that. So for example, here are the API costs for these new models. So DeepSeek R10528, that's the DeepSeek Reasoner. So here they have multiple prices for depending on when you're using it. There's a discount price, a standard price. Also, if you're using it cash or not, hit or miss. I mean, yeah, let's call it 13 cents to 55 cents input and between 50 cents to 2020 cents output per million tokens. For OpenAI, for the O3, we have input between 250 and $10, output $40 per 1 million tokens. For the Gemini 2.5 Pro preview, so let's call that from $1.25 to $2.50, and the output price is 10 to $15. So the Deep Seek R1 pricing is going to be very hard to beat, especially if it's keeping up and, and quickly keeping up with the leaders of the pack. The channel here on YouTube, AI Explained, has a great sort of mini documentary on DeepSeek, specifically the founder of DeepSeek. And here's the quote from the founder, Liang. He's saying, in the face of disruptive technologies, moats created by closed source are temporary. Even OpenAI's closed source approach can't prevent others from catching up. So we anchor our value in our team, an organization and culture capable of innovation. That's our moat. We will not change to closed source. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of stuff going on here. We have the race between China and US. And again, that's not just a narrative. The US officials, you saw the tweet from the Department of Energy. There was a speeches that were done at the UAE at that conference. This is happening. There's this bill that's likely going to be passed. There might be some changes to it that are still happening, but it's going to change the rules for how you write off various R&D expenses, specifically for domestic software development. So hopefully when and if this passes, somebody does a deep dive, somebody that knows a lot about this stuff that can actually explain what's happening. To me, this seems like this is a pretty big sort of incentive for U.S. tech companies to invest more into hiring engineers to develop AI and software, etc. This is kind of a way to subsidize AI development without ever using the word AI, as you can see here. Nathan Lands on X.com did a great kind of covering of what's happening in China at the same time. 
So here, while U.S. Uh, energy production is kind of uh, flatlined, China is uh, surging on ahead. Now, of course, keep in mind that everybody is on that sort of U.S. versus China competition mindset, right? So we certainly have a lot of cooperation. We have a lot of uh, students from China and researchers and people that come over here to get educated and some of them stay and work for U.S. labs. Some of them go back. And certainly, as Dr. Jim Fan here from NVIDIA says, you know, they are almost, you can think of DeepSeek as almost keeping the original mission of open AI alive, right? That truly open frontier research. So I think it's really important here to separate kind of like the researchers and the people working on this in the AI labs from kind of the governments of the two countries. They are not one and the same. And of course, there's a lot of cooperation between the researchers, right? The people that are putting out the papers, they share their secrets with everyone else. The community of researchers can use that. Everybody's made better because of it. But you're also seeing kind of a more and more overlap between the government and these AI labs on both sides. So please keep that in mind. I'm not necessarily pushing one narrative or another, not saying something is either good or bad. Uh, certainly, this is really good for the open source community as a whole. I'm just saying there's kind of a lot of moving pieces here. There's a lot of very powerful players. Everybody kind of has their own incentives. Also, we have a lot of the people in the Silicon Valley, kind of the tech leaders, normally pretty peace-loving people, maybe speaking out a little bit more against the dangers of China. Is it because they're worried for AI safety or is it because they're worried about competing with China and competing with open source? Maybe they feel if they can scare the government a little bit into action, then maybe the government will, for example, not allow export of certain chips to China, etc., making competition easier. So the point is there's a lot of moving pieces that don't necessarily buy into some simple narrative or another. But I think the big point here is that the wheels are turning ever faster. And there's more and more competition and more and more interest in the space and the stakes are rapidly ramping up. If you've been watching this channel from the beginning, I've kind of always said that it's highly unlikely that a few labs in the Bay Area are going to just be allowed to develop a super intelligence without the rest of the world noticing and just kind of going, yeah, go for it. We're not too worried about it. For a lot of companies and even for nations, a lot of people that are in control of those companies and nations probably see AI as an existential kind of a win or lose condition. Whether that's true or not, people are betting a lot on this. So stay tuned. We're just getting started. If you made this far, thank you so much for watching. My name is Wes Roth and I'll see you next time.